Okay, good morning. Uh, I'd like to, for all of you uh, that ha have uh, joined us in person, welcome to the Ohio UES Center. My name is Fred Judson. I'm the UES Director for the uh, Drive Ohio. I'm sorry. Yeah, we need a mic, right? We should have a mic. Uh, but so we're here today to for uh, the University of Cincinnati's interim report on this, on uh, research projects that we have uh, with them. Uh, and I'll introduce them in just a second. Just a couple housekeeping items. Uh, the bathrooms, if you stick to, if you're here in the, uh, at the UAS Center, if you stick to the glass wall on the left and walk all the way down, the bathrooms are on the right. Uh, I want to remind everybody who's in the room or is with us today that wants continuing education credits for this, Jill will be passing those out at the end. Uh, there's also a sign-in sheet and, and when you enter um, the room over here that if you haven't signed in, uh, please do that as soon as you can. Uh, with that, uh, I just want a couple of items, more items. I want to thank uh, research, Jill, Michelle, and all your team. You guys have done great with us and uh, we really appreciate everything that helped pull this uh, research together. Art, you and your team are amazing, and uh, I can't wait to see your presentation. So without any further ado, Art, Dr. Hillmickey, would you mind? Good morning, everyone. Can everybody hear me? Good. Uh, and uh, welcome to uh, our webinar. I am uh, Arthur Hillmickey. And I am a faculty member in electrical and computer electrical engineering and computer science at the University of Cincinnati, and uh, I am the PI on this project. And I will be introducing us to uh, work today on our interim report. This is a three-year project uh, with the Ohio Department of Transportation. Uh, we're through our second year. We have about a year left on this project. And I, uh, like Fred, want to extend my thanks to the folks at ODOT for the opportunity for uh, those of us in the research team here at the University of Cincinnati to work on this exciting uh, project. So the title slide here has kind of a working um, uh, line that describes our project, UAS research in support of uh, ODOT operations. And um, the next slide covers uh, the basic project objectives. Uh, and the team. The project actually has a pretty uh, wide uh, scope and a set of objectives to uh, uh, look at ODOT core business functions and to try to figure out um, which of those core business functions might benefit from the application of uh, UAV technologies and then to explore some of those through the development of uh, some prototypes and some uh, test missions. The figure at the bottom right here kind of captures what we're trying to achieve in this three-year period. We're trying to look at uh, flight and payload capabilities as they currently exist in the UAV marketplace today, merging those with information processing capability, and then putting that together with the needs that uh, ODOT has for various missions, and trying to find that elusive sweet spot in the middle where we meet uh, all three. We have a team of uh, researchers uh, on this project from uh, multidisciplinary areas within the University of Cincinnati. Kelly Cohen from Aerospace, myself from Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, uh, Victor Hunt from Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, Manish Kumar from Mechanical Engineering, and Madi Narazi from Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. And then we're backed by a uh, healthy staff and student population uh, from across these departments. And you'll be hearing from many of these folks today. I'm just going to kick off the presentation and then turn it over uh, to them to explain uh, some of the details. Before I do that, I want to say a couple of words about the vision of the project. So the mission uh, and the objectives for this project are quite broad. And uh, we've tried to formulate inside our research team uh, a kind of vision to flesh out that objective and meet that objective. And it involves uh, the material on this slide, which is uh, kind of um, an end-to-end -end vision for how UAVs uh, might be applied uh, to meet ODOT core business functions. 
It begins and ends with ODOT. So we identify within ODOT some mission, and then we try to research how one would plan such a mission, what would, be, what would be involved in such a mission. We next look at vehicles and payloads that would be necessary to carry that mission out, right? So what kind of configurations do we need? And uh, how would we uh, uh, obtain those? Then we look at flight operations. So when you go out into the field, right, you're going to actually have to fly uh, the UAV, obtain some sorts of data, and hopefully come up with some mission checks before you leave the field to make sure that all the uh, data you needed, you got, and you got of high quality. So these first three boxes encompass something called a set of standard operating procedures, which we're trying to develop as a byproduct of this research project that would uh, help ODOT with uh, training and uh, field operations. So then we have the data, now we have to somehow uplink it from the field back to whomever. And that could be something as simple as carrying a flash drive or a memory card with you back from the field, or it could be more complicated. In certain scenarios, you may want people remote from you in the field to simultaneously be able to look at what it is that you're seeing in the field. Say, an emergency management scenario or a traffic monitoring scenario or something like that. So another facet of this project is that we've developed something called the mission box, milestone mission box, which allows us to uplink in real time video or data coming out of the drone to uh, ODOT uh, video servers. And so it can be viewed uh, tele-remotely by anybody who has uh, privileges on, on Milestone. So the, that data then can be uplinked and it can be brought in for data processing. So we'll hear more about the kinds of processing that we've been able to achieve on this project as we go through. Uh, and then ultimately we want to be able to visualize and interpret that data to turn the data into information that's actionable for ODOT needs and ODOT core business functions. And uh, so those two pieces we brought together into something called the Common Operating Platform, which is a server-based software platform that will allow automation of a lot of the processing of the data coming out of our uh, efforts. And so then ultimately uh, that would go back and feed into, in a feedback fashion, better missions or more missions to get more data or it could go directly back to uh, ODOT folks. And so this is kind of an end-to-end -end view. It's more than just buying a few drones and flying them around to see what they can do. We're looking at trying to touch every one of these uh, light green boxes uh, before this project ends. So commensurate with that end-to-end -end vision, we have kind of uh, a lot of moving parts in this project. And we're going to try to cover as many of those as we can today. This webinar is supposed to last an hour and 30 minutes. We're shooting for about uh, 60 or 70 slides here. We're going to go through in the first hour of this presentation, and then we're going to turn it over for Q&A in the last 30 minutes or so. And uh, this slide covers, uh, in dark blue, all the things we'll be talking about today. Uh, I'm talking here about the uh, project's vision uh, uh, and objectives. We're going to then next go into our UAV platforms and a little introduction to UAV technology and terminologies. And then there's going to be several parallel sessions on sub-projects that are uh, carried on within this master research project. And we're going to try to highlight uh, basically four of the many that are ongoing. And then ultimately we're going to get back to these kind of cross-cutting technologies that bring this whole uh, effort together in a way of feeding the information back to ODOT in a reasonable way. Conclusions, future work, and ultimately Q&A. A couple more things before we uh, delve into UAVs. One of the uh, uh, key deliverables in this project is to develop these standard operating procedures, which is going to guide the folks at the UAS Center here and uh, lar more in the more larger uh, in the larger audience uh, at ODOT uh, into applications of UAVs. And we have developed uh, a master standard operating procedure, which covers general operations uh, of UAVs, and then a series of appendices that are currently in draft form covering various application areas. I'd also like to note that this project isn't being done kind of in isolation in a laboratory. And point of fact, we're spending at least half, if not more, of our time out in the field. And to date, that we've looked at uh, uh, field activities to obtain data and run tests in nearly half of the uh, ODOT districts across the state, covering a wide range of uh, areas, uh, as indicated on this slide. And again, you'll be hearing more about this uh, as the webinar goes on. Lastly, we're uh, pretty active. This isn't just a matter of going out to the field and then coming back um, and cogitating. 
Uh, in the last year alone of this project, we've run uh, over 82 missions, which means we're out in the field flying on average close to twice a week and uh, in various areas covering various topics. The statistics for 2017 on this project, the 2016, were largely the same, and we're actually hoping to ramp it up a bit in this last year uh, as we move forward to the closure of this project. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Brian Brown, one of our staff members who's a Part 107 pilot. Uh, he handles a lot of our infield drone operations or leads up the team that handles those operations. He's also responsible for maintaining uh, the fleet of drones that he'll be talking to you about next. Brian. Thank you. <clears throat> so before I uh, begin, I'd like to kind of go over a couple of terms. Um, you'll hear UAV, UAS, SUAS, uh, drone. Um, throughout this project, we kind of use them interchangeably. So if you hear one, it all means uh, the same uh, thing. Um, so we do fly underneath FAA's uh, small UAS rule, um, otherwise known as Part 107. Um, what Part 107 uh, requires us to do is fly underneath certain rules. Um, this includes less than 55 pounds, um, fly in Class G airspace, maintain visual line of sight, um, fly at or below 400 feet, and then fly during daylight or civil twilight hours. Now these rules can be um, waived. We have uh, actually quite a few airspace waivers that we've used over the course of this project, um, and I can, I'll go into that in just a minute. Um, and we're also um, watching, uh, so FAA just uh, released their, or the Reauthorization Act of 2018, um, so we're going to be following that and see how those uh, new rules will affect um, both our project and ODOT in general. Um, so this is kind of a, an example of how um, airspace waivers work. Um, the airspace is divided into grids. Um, each grid will have a maximum operation altitude. Um, and then so the closer you are to an airport or to specifically the runway, um, the lower it's going to be. So um, you aren't going to be able to fly off the runway, so you're going to have a zero altitude. But the further out you go, um, you can get up in higher altitudes, 200, 300, 400 feet. Uh, the primary uh, SUAS systems that we use is the DJI Matrice 100. Um, this is more of a development platform, um, has a flight time of about 20 to 35 minutes. Um, and we use it mostly for our aerial mapping and uh, traffic monitoring. Um, we also utilize a uh, DJI Matrice 210 RTK. Um, the 210 allows us to have a, a dual camera system, um, an op optional top mounted camera um, for doing inspections. Uh, uses real-time kinematic uh, GPS, um, has the ability for ADS-BN so we can uh, see other aircraft, and has a flight time between 25 and 38 minutes. Uh, we use this uh, mostly for um, bridge and facilities inspection as well as our aerial mapping. <clears throat> um, we can utilize uh, the other aircraft that are um, offered at the uh, Ohio UAS Center. Um, these include a, a DJI Inspire 2, um, SenseFly EV, Intel Falcon 8, uh, Skydio R1 and the flyability uh, Elios. Um, they all have their kind of um, strengths and downsides when for operations. So um, there's not one drone that's going to solve every single problem. Um, a major focus of this research project was actually to develop uh, or look into um, tethered platforms. Um, a tethered UAS allows for longer flight time. Um, because we're actually supplying power through a uh, tether that's um, from a generator on the ground. Um, this project allowed us for the evaluation and testing of such tethers. Um, our current tethered platform is a modified Matrice 100. Um, we have tested up to four hours. The manufacturer has tested over 24 hours, um, and we get a maximum altitude of 200 feet. Um, the nice thing with these uh, tethered platforms is because you get the longer flight time, it makes it ideal for um, doing traffic monitoring. Um, so part of the FAA Reauthorization Act of 2018, um, they're going to be coming out with what they consider a publicly actively tethered unmanned aer aircraft system. Um, this needs to be 4.4 pounds or less, needs to be able to fly at 150 feet. Um, and is controlled um, by a ground station that's connected to the tether. Um, what this kind of does is open up um, a little bit of areas, especially for um, operations, so we can operate within Class G airspace. Um, 
we still can't fly over um, non-participating persons. We need to fly over in um, <clears throat> visual line of sight. Um, but this tether system will hopefully help ODOT um, business functions and um, <clears throat> um, yeah. Um, so part of our uh, payload systems that we use um, are mostly from the DJI platforms. Uh, this includes a, a Z30, which is a 30 eps optical zoom camera um, using for bridge and traffic monitoring. Uh, we do have a Z3, which is a 3x optical zoom camera um, that's a higher resolution at 4K. Uh, we have um, the X5 and X5S high resolution cameras with interchangeable lenses that we use for mapping and traffic monitoring. And then we have the XTR or thermal radiometric camera um, used for bridge and facilities inspection. Um, so what we do with a lot of these cameras is um, collect data and then we use it for processing. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Arjun, who's going to talk about some of our traffic monitoring processing. Good morning, everyone. My name is Arjun and I'm going to talk about traffic monitoring in general and then traffic monitoring for the uninterrupted uh, traffic pattern. Um, before we went out and flew drones to record, before we went out and record traffic data, uh, we wanted to understand the traffic parameters and wanted to know how we can express them in terms of equations. So we went to the highway capacity manual and uh, as our primary source of information and came up with different traffic parameters for interrupted and uninterrupted flow. This diagram shows the general architecture for our uh, traffic monitoring. Uh, it is divided into three modules, uh, the input module on the left side, a uh, processing unit in the middle, and an output module. Input module shows you how we collect data, what the standard operating procedure is, uh, that tells you how to fly a drone, where to fly a drone from, and there's a slide, uh, there's a slide that will talk about this in detail. Process, uh, processing unit is a series of object detection, tracking, and parameter extraction. Uh, uh, and we have different flavors of this depending on different traffic data and the parameters that we want to extract. Uh, for example, it could be interrupted flow or the uninterrupted flow, and depending on that, we have different flavor of this module. On the third side, the output module, we have two different uh, types, interrupted and uninterrupted again. Uh, for interrupted flow, it could be something like the signalized intersection, and the traffic parameter that we extract from this are uh, headway, saturation, flow rate, and queue length. And for uninterrupted flow, uh, we have average travel speed, which is space mean speed, uh, flow rate, and density of traffic. Uh, the diagram that you see on the right side here is the diagram we got from the FHWA, uh, and it shows 13 different vehicle classifications. Uh, looking at limitations of image processing and computer vision, we classify, we have just two classification, passenger cars in blue box, and all green boxes are classified as trucks. Let's take a look at two different terminologies, object detection and object tracking. Object detection is merely understanding there is a known object in an image and we show it by drawing uh, a bounding box on top of it. And some examples would be YOLO object detection, background subtraction, or any other CNN. I use YOLO object detection for my uh, code. Next is object tracking. We assign ID to a detected object and track its movement in the, uh, subs uh, in the next coming frames. So we know it is the same object that is moving to different location in a video. Uh, different examples of object tracking would be uh, KCF, median flow, or MIL. I use median flow in my code. Well, this is the slide about the input model from the architecture. Uh, and the standard operating procedure that we got, uh, where we have uh, the optimum angle and we have good processing capabilities. On the left side, we have the orientation to the roadway. We tried recording data uh, when the drone is looking to the left side of the road, uh, when it is looking to the right side of the road or perpendicular. When it was looking to the left or right, uh, the tracking was not good and speed calculations were very inaccurate. But when we were looking at perpendicularly, Speed, speed calculations were perfect, and tracking was also amazing. So we decided to go ahead with that. On the right side, we needed to know uh, how high to go, how far away we should be from the roadway. We wanted to find an angle such that two vehicles in the adjacent lanes are not hiding behind each other. 
and we realize the angle uh, to get that is between 45 to 50 degrees when looking at the horizon, which is denoted by theta in this diagram. And you can achieve that angle easily if uh, the base distance and altitude are in the ratio of 1 to 1.15. Okay, let's take a look at uh, one of the case studies that we have uh, when we were uh, looking at traffic data on I-75 southbound uh, and the ramp was merging from Michel Avenue. In this diagram, it shows the it shows the satellite view of the same same location, and rail lines denote the location of power lines. Uh, and we came up with site A, B, C, and D, uh, which are these different pins uh, where we could fly and potentially record data from. But we decided to go with site D, uh, looking at proximity to power lines and uh, the roadway. Uh, next slide is going to show you a small teaser video of 10 seconds. It shows the traffic data recorded from site D, and you want to look at uh, the tracking and detection of vehicles, different colored boxes uh, for cars and trucks. Uh, and on top of it, it will show the direction the vehicle is going, the ID of the vehicle, the classification of the vehicle, and average speed of the vehicle in miles per hour. It also shows different counts in terms of how many vehicles are on the interstate, how many vehicles are on the ramp. Okay, this diagram on the right side is the one we got from the highway capacity manual for the uninterrupted flow. And we also came across three different parameters, flow rate, average travel speed, and density. Uh, flow rate is number of vehicles we count in an hour. Uh, average travel speed is the space mean speed expressed in terms of miles per hour, and density is division of flow rate by the average travel speed and expressed in uh, vehicles per mile. In this diagram, you can see two uh, different shaded area, green and red. Uh, when you record traffic and calculate these three parameters and plot it against each other on these scatter plots, you will get uh, points either in green or red side. If you get them on the green side, it denotes that the traffic pattern is undersaturated and free flowing. And on the red, red side, it shows it is a denser traffic with slower speed and higher densities. On the left side, okay, th this slide shows two different traffic patterns that we observed. On the left side is data from April 18th, and on the right side is from April 25th. Uh, this shows example of difference between free flowing, not free flowing, high speed, low speed, higher density, and lower density traffic. Uh, please note that this snippet is just 10 seconds from our long video that we record from the site. And next slide is going to show you the parameters extracted from these two different uh, scenarios. On the left side, we have April 18 data, which was free flowing and faster speed. So you can see a lot of points are in the green part of the graph. Uh, and on the right side, we have a few points on the undersaturated and a few points on the oversaturated. That denotes that uh, there was some time when traffic was oversaturated and most of it was, sorry, most of the time it was oversaturated and some time it was undersaturated, looking at number of points. And you get one point for each minute of traffic data. So 60 points, 60 minutes of data. This graph just shows uh, how we actually uh, count the vehicles by machine, and then we compare the results against the ground truth value. And for ground truth value, uh, I manually click the vehicles using a clicker, and then we uh, calculate error rate based on the difference between human count and machine count. And our, our error rate is uh, less than 15%. Accuracy is pretty good. Usually it's about 95%, but I would like to say it's just about 85%. This is the next generation of traffic monitoring. Um, Based on the work that we have seen previously, it was looking at the entire, entire traffic and parameters were extracted for the entire flow, if it was southbound or northbound, or left or right. But now we are going way further, uh, one step deeper. We are looking at traffic data per lane and extracting those traffic parameters for each lane. Uh, so we came up with two different approaches, uh, two different features. Uh, first is region of interest, where we clip away the part that we don't need and only look at the important part of the traffic, uh, which is just the roadway. and Feature extraction is mapping and tracking the location of vehicle as it moves, and uh, we get the trajectory of each vehicle, and we store the trajectories of all the vehicles that we observe. And all these trajectories are used in the next part. So, video on the left side uh, shows the traffic data from site D, and the orange part 
is just shaded region of one lane uh, where the vehicle with ID60 goes through. And on the right side, you can see the trajectory plotted for that vehicle. As you can see, it is not very smooth. So we use a different machine learning technique like linear regression to smoothen it out. And this helps us to classify each vehicle to a particular lane. And after that, after the classification is done, we calculate the traffic parameters of average travel speed, uh, density, and flow rate for each lane. And when we have those parameters for each lane, we try to just, just as an experiment, we tried plotting them against each other on the same graph. On the right side, you can see different labels, uh, lane 0, 1, 3, 4, 5, and 6, which was assigned by the machine. And on the, on the left side are the parameters extracted for uh, lane 1, 4, 5, and 6. An interesting observation can be found here uh, in the speed versus density curve. Lane 1, which belongs to the ramp, has orange points, uh, which shows higher speeds. And later on, lane 6 is faster than lane 5, is faster than lane 4. Uh, which we would ideally see lens 6 is usually faster than 5 and then on 4. Well, the accuracy of our results are really good. It shows you a good story. It shows you a good conclusion if the traffic is undersaturated or oversaturated per lane. But we face certain issues. Why the accuracy is not 100%? Why we face issues up to 15, uh, errors up to 15%? We face issues of two types. First is misdetection. Sometimes machine does not detect a vehicle going through. It just goes through without detection, so you lose that data. Second is false alarms. Uh, this is very funny uh, because the way machine is trained, sometimes it looks at this uh, this diagram. The, tr the truck head is counted once and the trailer is counted once. If there are multiple trailers, they are counted multiple times. Uh, pickup truck it belongs to both the categories, uh, passenger car as well as the truck category. Sometimes it is counted twice, but not always. What about the car carrier here? <laughs> a human would count this just once because it would be just one vehicle. But machine can see there are multiple vehicles going through it. It's very difficult to distinguish between uh, these kind of errors. But the good thing is this error does not uh, affect the pattern that you mine from the graphs. It, sh it does not affect uh, the output of the graph, the conclusion, if it is oversaturated or undersaturated. Okay, that's it for the under, uh, uninterrupted flow. Uh, now I would like to hand over to Rumit Kumar for the interrupted flow. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Rumit Kumar, and uh, so so far, uh, you saw like uh, we have like couple of UAV platforms, and uh, we use them to conduct flights and do several tasks. So you saw that we have looked into the uninterrupted traffic flow. Then the next category which we tried to study was interrupted traffic monitoring, where we basically looked at uh, signalized intersections and see what all parameters we can uh, extract from that. Again, our source was highway capacity manual, and uh, we conducted several flights at MLK and Clifton Avenue. Then we did flights at US 50 and Miamisburg Centerville Road. So over here, a little background information about saturation headway and saturation flow rate so in this animation you will see as the signal changes green the vehicles actually start moving and the first vehicle takes slightly more time and then eventually the other vehicles pick up so later this time period actually converges to a almost single value and that is termed as saturation headway for that particular intersection now if we assume that there was a green light for complete 60 minutes of uh, hour. So how many vehicles can pass through that intersection at that point of time? So that parameter is used to derive what, what is saturation flow rate. So these are the two parameters which we are interested in. And uh, over here, you will see that this is one of the flights which we did at MLK and Clifton signal. So you can see as the signal change is green over here, the vehicles start moving and we have lane one and lane two. And uh, as the vehicles move, uh, the drone records that video and then we bring it back to our lab. We post process it. We basically count what all the number of vehicles which cross the intersection and we try to extract headway and saturation flow rate data from that video. Secondly, how do we confirm what our numbers are and if they are right or not? 
so we basically got a jmr tdc at counter and we compared our results against the values which came out of jmr tdc at counter so these are the results for the flights which were conducted at mlk and signal uh, and a, and a clifton signal so over here you can see that uh, there are three test cases in this table and uh, we flew at different altitudes and these flights were conducted with a tethered drone which basically captured several light cycles so if you see over here there are several number of light cycles which were captured so for first case we captured six green lights then five green lights and seven green lights and based on that we tried to post process those videos and replicate the basic diagram which is available in uh, uh, highway capacity manual and these are the numbers which you see over here which we are getting for headway so you can see uh, on the left side you see the headway which came out of the machine algorithm and on the right side you see the headway data which came out of jmr uh, tdc8 counter and similarly the saturation flow rate uh, for the computer vision algorithm and uh, saturation flow rate for that particular intersection using the jmr tdc8 counter and uh, the error is very minimal in this case and uh, the computer vision algorithm basically concludes that the saturation headway for respective lane 1 and 2 was say 2.27 seconds and say 2.24 seconds which can further be extrapolated to saturation flow rate at both the lanes so this is one very ideal scenario where we can do flights looking perpendicular to the traffic but there are several scenarios where we have to deploy our uavs from very cluttered locations for example in this case when we were trying to do studies at us 50 so most of the we, we are interested in this particular uh, section and we want to do q study at this point but if you see very much of a cluttered environment there are some industries nearby and there are residential areas and there were three possible flight locations so as my colleague mentioned earlier about fa uh, regulations so based on that if you see there was a airport also nearby uh, lankan airport was nearby and uh, uh, we were actually restrained uh, by those rules that we cannot uh, like you know deploy drones from specific locations so we had to like deploy uh, the drone from this particular point and uh, we were basically looking from back side of the intersection so a little bit of background information about the q studies the q studies basically deal with uh, four parameters i would say uh, the capacity at the intersection the demand of the intersection then under saturated traffic flow and over saturated traffic flow so at the bottom diagrams you will see like when the green light is available and over here during the red light the q first builds up and during the green light uh, during the green light the q dissipates so in this case the capacity is greater than demand all the vehicles are able to cross the intersection in available green light time so we are good over here but on the right side if you see uh, this is the case when the problem start and uh, uh, the uh, signal becomes actually over saturated so you will see that some vehicles are actually not able to cross the intersection over here during the uh, available green light time so that is a similar phenomena which was happening at uh, us 50 and uh, so over here you will see uh, so this is a video where we tried to do arrival demand computation and uh, the method which we use over here is the method similar to what is proposed in mactrans highway capacity software manual so what happens is uh, for each light cycle we are finding what is the stop line count in the table so we are looking at the stop line count like how many vehicles departed the intersection then we are looking at the unmet demand that how many vehicles were not able to cross the intersection when the light changed from green to red and based on that we are <coughs> manipulating the data to compute the arrival demand in this video you see the snippet of that particular flight video uh, 
the, for the period one where we are finding the arrival demand. So you can see uh, the period one, two, three are part of one video, then period four and five are part of another video and so on. So in this case, like a zoomed in view of the same intersection, you, you, you take a look at this uh, red car and uh, then the signal change is green. These vehicles start moving and when the light changes back again to red, you will see that at least six to eight vehicles in this particular uh, cycle are actually not able to make it. So you see during the red light, the queue builds up and then the queue starts dissipating as the vehicles cross and in the end capacity uh, capacity is actually less than demand and the intersection is actually oversaturated where all the vehicles are not able to make it through the intersection so another scenario where <clears throat> we are actually not able to see the tail of the queue the queue is so long that we are not able to see how long the tail uh, the tail of the queue actually goes so in that scenario it does not even come into the frame of our video so what we do is we actually came up with a new metric where we track one particular vehicle when it joins the queue and we keep tracking it till it leaves the intersection and from that time we can categorize it to predict what is the level of service for that particular intersection and again we are like uh, referring to the literature in order to do that kind of classification then so that was the study at us 50 then we conducted flights at miamisburg centerville road near dayton and uh, over here we flew twice once in the morning and once in the afternoon so in the morning we conducted a two hour long endurance flight a continuous two hour long flight with the tethered uav and uh, we were interested in this particular intersection that what is the turn count of the vehicles coming in from this direction and turning on the I-75 ramp and how many vehicles are able to make it through this thing. And we were interested in finding the peak hour factor for this particular scenario. So we flew with Metris 100 UAV, which was tethered and we carried Z30 camera for that. And uh, so over here in the table, you will see there are four videos and uh, each video was 30 minutes long so we were able to extract the data in 15 minutes periods and there were these many number of red lights which were monitored and this is how the stop line count the unmet demand and arrival demand was computed but you can see it is a very efficient uh, it turns out to be a very efficient intersection because the unmet demand was always zero all the vehicles were actually able to make it through and based on that uh, we also found the peak hour factor for this, which later came out to be like 0 0.86 and 0 0.84 to respective hours. And uh, uh, the maximum number of vehicles which went straight were observed to be 264 uh, in the 15 minutes period. And the maximum turn count observed in 15 minutes periods was 188 in the morning flights. Then similarly, we conducted flights in the afternoon which were conducted with Metris 210 RTK UAV. And uh, again, we flew, uh, this time we flew basically, we will take off, we will fly for say 20 to 30 minutes, we will land, we will swap batteries and we will fly again. So over here you will see a discontinuity in the data when the aircraft had landed and we were doing some inspection or when we were swapping the batteries and again we were interested in looking at the turning counts for i-75 and the vehicles which were passing straight in this direction so since this data is not continuous we have not computed the peak hour factor for this case because the data is not continuous and uh, again over here this is also uh, like the unmet demand was zero in this case also and the maximum number of vehicles which went straight was observed as 240 and the maximum turn count was observed as 158 in during that span of time yeah so, so at this point i will uh, hand it over to my colleague ashwin who is going to talk about bridge and facilities inspection good morning to one and all present here uh, my name is ashwin and today I'm going to talk about the inspection side of the research project. 
under the inspection side, I'll be presenting our work pertaining to three inspection areas, namely construction site, facilities, and bridge inspection. Before I jump into our work, I'll briefly go over how an inspector can use available UA systems to conduct inspections easily. Second, our UCII is our general inspection work, workflow and few key terminologies that would aid you guys in following the content that is given in the slides I'll be talking about. So using the DJI Matrix 210 UAV and its ability to carry two cameras, an inspector with the help of a rumor pilot can easily record or see an area of interest to aid in inspections. Using a secondary remote, an inspector can take control of the camera on both the UAV while the remote pilot flies the UAV safely around the area of interest. As pictured in the slide here, an inspector can use a secondary remote to control the camera on both the flight, for example, to zoom into a column of the bridge while the remote pilot safely navigates the UAV around the bridge. In this slide, I have the general inspection workflow we follow at UC to help in improving the inspection process. This workflow is a slightly more complex approach compared to the method discussed in the previous slide. In the previous slide, an inspector could fly the UAV to a certain point of interest and inspect it thoroughly or record necessary images or videos. But with this workflow, we design specific flight paths to capture images of the area of interest and use available tools to construct simple and easy to understand static outputs like 3D point clouds and high quality 2D stitched images. In the first part of the workflow, we use DJI GS Pro flight planning application to design area specific flight plans and program a UAV to automate the process of image capture. <clears throat> the captured images are then fed to a professional photogrammetry software called Pix4D Mapper. Pix4D helps us to generate high quality outputs like 3D point clouds, 3D mesh files, orthomosaics, and contour plots. We then use these outputs accordingly to analyze the area that was mapped and arrive at various conclusions. UCI is also developing a web-based solution called the Common Operating Platform, which is built using the Pix4D engine. In its current state, users can upload images to the COP to generate 3D point clouds and Pix4D flights, files that can be later downloaded. And we'll be talking more about that in the later slides. Before I go over the work we have done till date with respect to inspections, I would like to go over a few key terms that, will, that I'll be using during the course of my presentation. When constructing flight, flight plans using the DJI GS Pro application, a user can adjust various flight parameters. Among the various flight parameters, there are two important flight parameters, which determine the quality and accuracy of the 3D model generated. They are ground sampling distance and overlap percentage. Ground sampling distance, or GSD, is simply the distance covered by each pixel in the image. To put this into context, suppose we take a photograph of an object x meters away from it and take another photograph of the same object at a greater distance, say 2x meters, it is easy to understand that the object in the first photograph is well defined when compared to the second photograph, and GSD is the metric that quantifies this phenomenon. Therefore, GSD is the value that helps determine the, uh, define the resolution of the objects in the image captured. Overlap percentage is the value that indicates the percentage of overlap between two images captured consecutively. When constructing points for the 3D point cloud, Pix4D mapper requires a point to be seen in at least three images, that is, images captured, re image captured requires 75 percentage overlap between them to ensure that the point is constructed accurately, which in turn generates accurate 3D representation of the objects. Once the 3D point cloud is constructed, using Pix4D Mapper, a user can calibrate the models to ensure improved accuracy. Using Pix4D Mapper, one can calibrate a 3D model using ground control points, scale constraints, and model type points. Ground control points <coughs> sorry, are large marked and contrasting targets laid out on the ground space strategically throughout the area being mapped. The GPS coordinates of the center of the targets are determined using RTK GPS systems. The GCPs and the coordinates are used to help Pix4D Mapper to accurately position the 3D model in relation to the real world. Scale constraint is a line of known length between two points in the area of interest. Scale, constraint, scale constraints in Pix4D Mapper aids in setting up the scale of the project. They are usually used when GCPs aren't being used and when images don't have good GPS coordinates value tagged with them. Manual type points, or MTPs, are points marked by a user on the images that give the software information about certain features contained in various images. 
Manual type ones are used to improve the 3D model reconstruction accuracy. Now I'm going to talk about our work in the construction site inspection. Given the knowledge of using appropriate GSD and overlap values, we, we had to also determine which flight pattern gave us the best results when measurements were recorded. We designed an experiment where we planned flight paths that flew in different patterns shown in the slide here. Images were captured in different patterns and 3D point clouds specific to each pattern were generated using those images. Measurements of various objects in the field were recorded and compared to the measurements recording, recorded using Pix4D Mapper and the error between the two values were recorded in the graph shown in the slide here. Models were generated using images from flight one pattern, flight two pattern, flight three's pattern, flight one and three, flight one and two combined, and flight one, two and three combined patterns. From the results generated, it was con concluded that a near accurate 3D model was generated when the image is captured in a grid pattern, that is using flight one and two. <clears throat> Even though adding images captured using the flight three improves the results at times, planning circular flight patterns, pattern missions may not be possible due to its location and area span. The information gained from these experiments was used to conduct our studies to on construction site inspection. Our first case study was conducted at District 10 Norwood during a landslide incident. We were able to assist inspectors to use our UAV platforms to hover over specific regions and record the videos of the landslide. We also mapped the area to construct a 3D model of the situation which can be used to assess the situation in depth or as a training material. The 3D model is calibrated using GCPs and MTPs to ensure it is positioned accurately in relation to the real world. Our second case study was conducted at District 10 State Route 266 construction site. In this study, we mapped over 14 acres of land to calculate the area of pre-splits near the intersection. We had to divide the intersection site into five different areas to assist in logistics and to ensure we are flying the UAV for short periods of time. We calibrated the 3D model using GCPs to using survey grade GCP coordinates to improve the accuracy in our area measurements. Our third case study was conducted at the District 10 State Route 266 construction site as well. In this study, we mapped over 200 acres of land to calculate the volume of land, volume of earth excavated and filled. We had to again divide this construction site into five areas to assist in logistics and ensure we were flying the UAV for short periods of time. Now I'm going to talk about our work in facilities and bridge inspection. As I mentioned in my initial slide, an inspector can easily use a Matrix 210 drone and a secondary remote to control the camera on board the UAV, while the remote pilot flies the UAV safely around the area of interest. When compared to traditional surveying methods, using UAVs to aid in inspection is a lot more convenient, cost-effective, and safer. Given the knowledge of the effect of various flight patterns, GSD, and overlap values, have on the accuracy of a 3D model, we also investigated the effect of different calibration methods on the measurements recorded. We designed an experiment where we calibrated a 3D model on PIX4D using the available calibration methods and compared various length measurement accuracies. From the results that we got, it was observed that, a, that calibrating a model using scale constraints in PIX4D generated models with the highest accuracy relative to other calibration methods as seen in the graphs here. The information gained from this experiment would aid us in selecting the appropriate calibrating methods depending on the site mapped. <clears throat> in order to aid in bridge inspections, we have to make sure the theoretical values of GST match the information gained from the image as well as the object itself. This would aid in identifying cracks and crack widths efficiently moving forward. We designed an experiment to test this and prove that the same GST values could be achieved at different distances using different camera available. The experiment was conducted using a DJI X5S camera and a DJI Z30 camera and a crack comparator card. The crack card was taped to the wall and images of the card were taken at different distances from the wall using both the cameras and at different zoom levels using the Z30 camera. The theoretical GST value was calculated for each, each scenario and the values were compared to the respective images. It was seen that we could clearly identify the crack bits on the card that matches the GST value as well as observe that the GST value, that the same GST value is achievable at different distances using different cameras. 
The information gathered from this experiment was used to generate a heat map that would aid an inspector to select the required camera setup and the distance away from a face for the desired GST value with relative ease. In order to use this heat map, a user would have to first select the desired GST for the mission, next look up the preferred camera and zoom level, and lastly re the required height or distance they will have to position their UAV camera. Now I'm going to talk about the various case studies that we did for the facilities and bridge inspection. Our first case study was conducted at the District 2 Northwood Garage. The garage's roof was mapped using a visual and a thermal camera. The images captured from the missions were used to build high-quality 2D stitched images called orthomosaics. The visual and thermal orthomosaics were studied in detail and the following observations were noted. Our observations and theories were presented to the personnel in charge and we got a confirmation from them stating that the garage had a heating issue where certain areas of the roof indicated by the darker shades on the thermal orthomosaics where the heating pipes were not functional. Our second case study was conducted at the District 6 ODOT headquarters. The headquarters roof was mapped using a visual and a thermal camera. The images captured from the missions were again used to build high quality thermal and visual orthomosaics. Having both visual and thermal orthomosaics would help an inspector to easily cross-refer information and make an informed decision about the structure. Using the orthomosaics generated, we were able to make multiple observations regarding the condition of the roof. Our meeting with the facility teams, facilities team helped in confirming certain observations we made about the condition of the roof and to understand the various measurements, measures taken by the facilities team to mitigate these issues. Our meeting with the facility teams at the headquarter, headquarters where we were able to understand the effectiveness of these results to study the condi condition of a roof and the measures that could be taken to maintain them. An inspector can also use a pix 4 e desktop application to aid in effective, effective, efficient inspections. pix 4 e mapper allows users to draw surfaces on 3D point clouds or 2D orthomosaics to view the individual images to use, use to create the area covered by the surface. The inspector can then later ins inspect the individual images in depth to gain more information. Inspectors can also use pix 4 e cloud service to upload generated outputs like orthomosaics as seen here. On the cloud website, inspectors can add notes or annotations and share the observations online with their peers in different corners of the state. Our third case study was conducted at the Jerma Moro Bridge. For our initial studies, we created flight plans for the UAV to map the northbound side of the bridge's deck. The images obtained was used to create a 3D model as shown here. The 3D model of the bridge was used to create 2D stitched image of the site called facades. The created facade was later studied to identify visible cracks or various artifacts that can be seen in the facade. During our studies, we were, we were also able to work with bridge inspectors and give them the secretary remote to control the camera on board the UAV. This allowed them to record videos and zoom into areas of interest on the bridge's deck, as shown in this animation below here. The facade that was created was superimposed on bridge plan sheets. An initial attempt was conducted to mark visible artifacts, <coughs> visible artifacts on the third pier of the bridge, as shown here. Superimposing bridge plan sheets on bridge facades as shown here would aid inspectors in documenting the health of the structure and study them over time. The accuracy of the, the non-calibrated 3D model was also recorded. The segment measurements recorded from the 3D point cloud was compared to the measurements in the plan sheets. And the mean of the absolute error was calculated to be 1.3 percentage, which is approximately 0.2 feet. It is important to ensure that the 3D model is to scale because it will play a role in identifying and classifying rocks identifying and class classifying cracks moving forward. Finally, I'm going to talk about the standard operating mo procedure mobile application that we have been developing. As mentioned before, we have been developing a set of standard operating procedure manuals for various inspection missions. This mobile application called the Mission Planner would allow a remote pilot to follow the standard operating procedures with relative ease. A remote pilot can create detailed flight plans specific to the mission type and use the information that the mobile application generates to create flight plans on the DGI GS Pro flight planning application. Next, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Helmiki to talk about our other work. Thank you. So up to this point, you've seen uh, a discussion of the various 
vehicle platforms and payloads. You've seen the application of these app, uh, payloads and vehicles in various uh, areas, namely traffic monitoring, uh, bridge monitoring, facilities inspection, construction site monitoring. I'm going to cover the last topic here, which involves bringing these things all together and integrating them uh, under one platform. So uh, if you recall, at the very beginning of uh, the talk, we showed the end-to-end -end vision for this project. And um, we had, uh, you know, where's my, there we go. We had uh, 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 a way of integrating all the information coming in from the drone on site and then communicating that with an off-site system. And I want to go into that in a little more detail now. So we have this uh, milestone mission box that uh, we have developed that allows Um, ODOT's a milestone uh, video streaming service, but under various vision, uh, versions of this box, we're able to also uh, have local area networks and the ability for people uh, locally at the, the scene to be able to also tap into uh, uh, video coming off the drone. We have ultimately uh, developed a production model of this uh, box that we're providing to the folks at the UAS Center. And uh, that allows them to stream video in real time to their servers to be able to uh, set up to transmit this for uh, uh, people to view uh, on various kinds of uh, augmented and virtual reality goggles. The next version of this will try to incorporate more and more intelligence in the box so we can possibly do some of the processing. something called the Common Operating Platform that will be able to integrate across the full spectrum of vehicles that we were talking about here today and the data uh, types and sources and be able to um, uh, provide this uh, uh, computer vision and uh, post-processing capabilities in real time. Uh, I'm sorry, not in real time, but uh, on, a, on, a common, on a common platform. This uh, is a container-based design that uh, will allow uh, multiple users uh, to run it uh, simultaneously. It will um, efficiently manage software licenses for uh, ODOT and the UAS Center. It'll have parallel processing and so uh, it will run uh, fairly quickly. In addition to being able to process the information, we would like to be able to um, interpret and visualize and so we've also spent uh, a little bit of time on this project looking at augmented and uh, virtual reality sources, and in particular, uh, the Microsoft HoloLens. The Microsoft HoloLens uh, is able to integrate information, and we've been able to merge it through our common operating platform so that uh, remote and local users can share sessions and uh, view data and communicate with uh, one another uh, on site. And this video demonstrates a little bit about, if I can get it to run. There we go. So what you see here is uh, one person in the foreground here using uh, the HoloLens, wearing it. Uh, viewing a model of uh, the Muscatatuck Urban Training Center where we uh, flew a series of missions and then built the model, labeled it. And in the upper right-hand corner is another person somewhere else. They could be anywhere else on the face of the earth uh, wearing a second set of HoloLens. And the two are communicating with one another, basically having a virtual meeting um, and uh, reviewing information uh, on this model in, uh, in real time. And they're able to, uh, to do a number of things. Uh, not the least of which is to uh, drag and drop information, uh, place markers uh, on the video, uh, and basically uh, uh, communicate in real time.
And we're looking at this for a, a wide variety of applications uh, where we're trying to interpret the data coming in from uh, 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 drone, uh, drone missions after it's been post-processed. So wrapping it up, conclusions at a high level, the research team has been able to identify several uh, core business functions within ODOT, which we believe could benefit from the application of UAV technologies. To follow up on that, the research team has uh, worked with those, those uh, things available on the marketplace. And uh, we have, although we didn't talk about it here today, we've been able to develop a series of customer uh, hardware uh, geared towards interior inspections where we have GPS deprived uh, environments. In the last year of the project, we hope to continue the work in a number of these areas, namely bridge inspection, facilities inspection, perhaps add some new areas like uh, uh, prototype areas like work zone inspection or work zone monitoring uh, and continue to uh, develop these application areas. The research team will look at finalizing the SOPs that we have to date and work with uh, the UAS uh, center personnel to develop uh, training procedures so that this work can be applied. We're looking to work with the uh, OTOT, ODOT IT folks to develop an implementation of the common operating platform within the OD, o, ODOT IT ecosystem and begin to use it and explore its capabilities. And lastly, we're looking to develop a series of uh, metrics to be able to quantify return on investment in these application areas so that ODOT can go forward and uh, uh, decide which application areas they like to pursue uh, further and which ones they're going to get the most bangs for the buck out of. At this point, that's all we have to present, and I guess we'll open it up to questions and answers, uh, either in the audience or uh, online. So uh, uh, this program is basically running just over $2 million, and like I said, 36 months. And what you're seeing here today is basically we're 24 months into the project. Question. You guys are ODOT considered the use of uh, UAV mounted LIDAR systems? Yes, yeah, so one of the aspects of the project that we were engaged in early on, we did not talk about here today, was the use of drones in interior inspection of facilities and, and, and bridges. And in that particular application, we looked at um, deploying LIDAR systems, small LIDAR systems on the drone, and then being able to use that uh, in lieu of the GPS for navigation and mapping. I am sorry. So rule of thumb. The question was, have we looked at all at the use of LIDAR mounted on uh, UAS systems? And uh, my answer was yes. Um, and in particular, the application area we, we, we explored was interior inspection. I'm going to add on to that. Uh, you talked about the use of LIDAR on closer to the mic. Uh, yes, yeah, so we did actually look at LIDAR for mapping as well. Um, early on, we identified it with, with the budget constraints that we had and as expensive as the light systems were, that uh, we weren't going to make that part of this project for mapping purposes. 
uh, and then Art was referring to navigation purposes inside of uh, structures. Uh, so we did look at that as well. Uh, my particular interest is in your metric applications. Do you intend to explore that in some depth later in this program? I'm sorry, could you, which applications? Uh, metric application, your last line there. Oh, so the question is, uh, are we uh, looking more into return on investment metrics? Not particularly investment, but the accuracy, the geospatial accuracy, particularly in elevation of drone applications. So the question uh, revolves around the accuracy of measurements made based on information coming in from drones, in particular geospatial uh, measurements of distances, areas, and volumes. And we have looked at all three of those, and while we didn't go into it in uh, extreme detail here, there were a number of graphs that were presented in the presentation which showed measurements in both one, two, and three dimensions based on uh, models obtained from drones at construction sites and at uh, bridge and facility sites. And we're able to typically get accuracy of measurements 95%, so 5% error based on models constructed using GCPs, manual tie points, and scale factors? Do you have a rule of thumb of elevation accuracy as a function of altitude above the ground? can't relate your percentages. So the percentages I'm referring to are actual distances, areas, or volumes as compared to those measured uh, in the model derived from the drone imagery. I think we can improve geospatial elevation accuracy by improved geometry of the arrangement of cameras on the drone. I'd be interested to talk to anybody who wants to talk about such things. Very good. So uh, the suggestion was that uh, geospatial uh, accuracy, the measurement accuracy could be improved by uh, alteration of the configuration and positioning of the cameras on the drones. Thank you. I'd be happy to talk to you after the, after the webinar. We have a couple more questions online. Thank you. For the augmented reality visualization, have you guys tried doing anything remotely with someone in field and someone doing a facility or bridge? If so, can you elaborate? Uh, so, do I have to repeat the question? So, so the question was, have we looked at uh, augmented reality applications where we have someone in the field and uh, someone uh, tele-remotely uh, not in the field, both looking at the same time? And the answer to that is no, we have not looked at that specific application, although we have looked at the situation, a virtual situation, where there is somebody in one building on campus and somebody in another building, and they're both linked uh, 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 through a network connection wearing two HoloLens systems. And they have been able to communicate with one another and uh, basically share information between, between them. My, my guess is that the, the limitation to that is going to be the quality of the network connection in the field. And as long as you have a good network connection in the field, being able to implement that should not be a difficulty. And it is something we will be looking at as we move forward. Next question. Have you looked at any applications that require beyond visual line of sight? If so, have you gotten a waiver to do this? So the question is, has we, have we looked at any applications that require beyond visual line of sight? And if so, have we applied for and received any waivers. Uh, this particular project has not looked at any of those applications. The closest we came was the uh, construction site monitoring application that was discussed earlier where we we're uh, mapping over several hundred miles and the drone actually did uh, have to travel quite a distance from the pilot, uh, although we were able to barely uh, maintain a line of sight uh, uh, in that particular application. Brian, do you have anything to add to that? No. Fred? Yeah, so the UAS Center itself is exploring beyond line of sight um, 
waivers, uh, mostly using our ground-based detect and avoid. Uh, we're working with a, a, uh, Air Force Research Labs, who's also who's already applied for um, the online visual site, and we're working through that process with the FAA right now. Uh, but the, uh, the online visual site is something that uh, that we are working forward with with the FAA uh, for a bunch of different applications, uh, highway mapping and being one of those. So then the next question that is probably if it's related to beyond visual line of sight, what other way, waivers have you been able to use? Uh, so as total, and, and this is outside of our, a little bit outside of our research project, uh, we have worked with the University of Cincinnati and several universities on different waivers or uh, certificate, certificate of applications. I myself, is a, I've worked on over 60 different certificate of authorizations or waivers. Uh, in those, we've asked for uh, aerospace um, allowing us to fly in, in restricted or controlled airspace uh, above, uh, you know, we've flown up uh, you know, 1,200 feet and higher, uh, so we had to have waivers for that. Um, yeah, so we, we've been through that waiver process quite a bit, but if everybody knows the FAA, that beyond line of sight's like uh, the golden egg, right? That's that's the that's the one everybody wants, to, but it's also the one that's hardest to get. Uh, there are other th other, uh, other waivers that we are working on that we have not been successful yet in getting as flights over people, which is something that uh, we are we are also working on as well. But as far as all the other waivers that we've applied for, we've applied for several more, probably more than any other state agency in the U.S. Uh, I, I feel pretty comfortable in saying that. Uh, but for all different over 55 pounds speed limits. Uh, airspace designations, uh, altitudes, um, day and, and night. day and night, yeah, day and night wa uh, waivers, and then uh, not even uh, we've even had uh, waivers that aren't in the state of Ohio, and then we worked with the uh, University of Cincinnati on that for uh, West Virginia uh, and uh, Indiana. So this question is going to be for both of you. Have you done work with crash site reconstruction, and if? you or someone else has, is the data gathered permissible in Ohio courts? Well, if, if there is a Chris Kinn online who from the Department of Public Safety, that would uh, refer that question to him. Uh, he's the uh, crash reconstructionist for the Department of Public Safety. Um, now, crash scene reconstruction uses the same methods as, as uh, uh, like facilities inspections. Um, well, whether or not it's admissible in court, I'm, it's outside of my wheelhouse at this point as far as uh, investigations go. Uh, you want to add anything here? Yeah, no. The, uh, the, only, the only thing I would add is that the crash site reconstruction would involve flying in and around a traffic site. And so you're, you have some logistical issues with flying over non-participants and things like that. But in, 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 in practice, um, the ability to construct accurate 3D models and representations of a crash site shouldn't be any different than flying over uh, an ODOT facility. And we know how to do that f fairly well. So it, it, it's primarily a logistical issue. And as far as I know, we, you know, we certainly haven't been involved in any court cases uh, up to this point. Has any interest been shown from federal highway in regards to some of the language that brings inspections on this? I know at this point the stance is pretty much been it's a tool to supplement your visual inspections. Is this data going to provide, you know, qualitative or quantitative results or definitive enough that they would be comfortable in changing or altering their language to allow drone imagery for the visual inspections in some regards with the caveat that additional inspection by a qualified inspector at arm's length would be required? So the question revolved around the issue of whether or not um, the uh, FHWA is allowing basically a drone based uh, inspections in lieu of actual arm's length inspections and or any of the changing in the language of the legislation uh, pursuant to a bridge inspection. And we are not looking at that right now. We're looking at basically feasibility and what can UAVs do to augment inspectors. 
Um, we're not really looking at whether or not we can replace inspectors. The idea would be to, uh, to do a couple of things. First of all, to be able to get the inspector's eyes someplace that he or she would otherwise uh, have to go to great lengths to get to themselves. Um, and the idea there would be that you could look at a bridge as an extremely large structure and maybe allow the inspector to cover a lot of it using a drone and then hone in on just a few small places where the inspector feels that they have to actually physically get themselves. That would be one issue. The second issue is, of course, on structures uh, where snoopers are involved. Snoopers uh, in pretty much every state in the United States are a hot commodity. And so the ability to alleviate the need for um, uh, snooper time and, and to help with that a little bit. Uh, another area that we're looking at is the ability to, uh, as Ashwin talked about, to be able to build these models as a form of documenting the state of, the state of the structure. And then those documents could be stored off and inspector could come a year later or two years later or 10 years later and run another set of missions and get another set of imagery and compare and contrast uh, uh, before and after to be able to, to tell the extent of changes. Uh, uh, also to be able to document right on the images, to be able to drag and drop notes directly on the images would be uh, another type of thing we're looking at. A final kind of thing would be using augmented reality to cross register plan sheets against visual images so that the inspector uh, either in real time at the site or afterwards would be able to overlay the model against the plan sheets. Ultimately, we would like to be able to get to the point where the accuracies are such that one can make measurements uh, based on visual inspections, uh, drone-based inspection and inspection models, and be able to determine whether um, there has been a movement or tilts or uh, other kinds of features going on in the field that would be hard to detect in a visual inspection but could be quantified uh, if the drone models are accurate. We, we're not quite at that level yet, but that's a goal we're shooting towards. So there's this long list of wish items I think that uh, bridge inspectors would have uh, and, and drones could possibly help with one or more of these. Um, and at this point, uh, we're on the learning curve on, on many of those, but we're making progress. And some additional comments? Yeah, so, um, so we also operate as the Department of Transportation. We have pilots that are out there doing bridge inspections right now. And with the help of the UC, we have already identified several bridges where we can augment those snooper operations. Uh, where we, so at the arm's length inspection, uh, the f uh, federal highways usually requires every two years. Certain structures we've deemed that we're going to go out every year. Uh, but on several occasions, we have to do nighttime snooper evaluations uh, because of the traffic volume, which makes it difficult uh, and uh, increases our safety footprint, uh, where now we've been able to utilize unmanned aircraft to now go back to every two-year schedule for uh, a lot of bridges for, for the snooper truck and we don't have to do it at nighttime we can do it in the daytime and we can deploy faster uh, and still get the information that we need to just to offset that just that one year but just offsetting one year it's like four thousand dollars a day right so every day that we don't have to send a snooper truck out or every day it could be applied to somewhere else where it's needed instead of uh, you know uh, every year it can do every other year uh, we're starting to see a return on investment pretty quick from that. Uh, also, I'm on the Everyday uh, Everyday Counts uh, Committee, the EDC-5, for UAS implementation for federal highways. So if you guys want more information, because uh, we're writing up uh, specs on how to implement unmanned aircraft across all the state DOTs, uh, that look up the Everyday Counts uh, Committee, EDC-5, for unmanned aircraft systems and uh, there'll be recommendations coming out in the real near future and I believe I think all the workshops have uh, already happened with that committee but um, I would go to that web page and um, and check out and see what kind of uh, more information you can glean from that Idea impacts due to 
We have issues with detection. We have issues with algorithms that are, that are applied. So um, we have a flight envelope that's part of our SOP. So I'm sorry, the question. The question is uh, how do uh, various um, uh, environmental, uh, atmospheric, and weather conditions affect our ability to deploy drones and then get either uh, video for traffic monitoring or images for uh, later reconstruction of uh, 2D and 3D uh, inspection models. And uh, we have looked at running experiments under different weather conditions um, to try to uh, 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 extract parameters from either video or uh, through imagery. And we have uh, flight envelopes that we try to adhere to uh, in terms of wind speed and uh, part 107, uh, twilight, things like that, um, where it's safe to operate the UAVs in the field. Uh, we have looked at various lighting conditions. Um, ironically, one of the things we haven't talked about here is the use, for example, of uh, infrared cameras. Uh, to detect things like cracks or voids uh, and you might want to fly under certain scenarios like uh, you have a very sunny day and then you might want to take your flight at the end of the day as thing, the sun is going down and things are cooling off to be able to get the best contrast in your imagery to be able to detect things like that. So those are things that we're building into our SOPs. Uh, in terms of the computer vision and traffic monitoring and the ability to recognize, uh, use computer vision algorithms to recognize under various conditions, um, we talked a little bit in the presentation today about occlusion, so being able to fly at uh, altitudes and distances so that uh, traffic in adjacent lanes don't occlude one another, um, and that increases accuracy. Very stark shadows will uh, have an effect somewhat on uh, computer vision, although the better you train your neural networks and uh, 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 vis vision algorithms, uh, you, can, you can minimize that effect and that's something that's uh, currently under research that we're looking at. Um, fog, we have not flown much in. Uh, you have the issue of uh, one of these drone systems is in the tens of thousands of dollars easily once you uh, purchase it and outfit it with payloads. And so taking something like that out in, in, in near precipitation or precipitation conditions. Um, the Matrice 210 has sealed motors, so it has all-weather capability, but the cameras do not. And so the ability to fly reliably and get good data under certain conditions uh, is also uh, suspect. And so we try to avoid those conditions uh, if, at all, if at all possible. So, I, I mean, kind of following up on that, right, um, we're approaching winter time here and, you know, you're trying to take a picture of a polar bear in the snow uh, and, and those kinds of things are stuff we're, we, are, we are currently actively studying. Yes? Is there any concern about driver distraction from a safety standpoint if you're flying to traffic? So the question was, is there any uh, uh, concerns we have in terms of distracted driver scenarios when we're trying to deploy uh, in or near roadways? Uh, and we have looked at that sort of uh, situation. Um, we typically fly above 100 feet. Uh, at that point, if you're in your car moving, um, the drone looks like a dot in the sky and you probably are not going to notice it. Um, we. We, uh, uh, we tend to deploy well enough, uh, far enough off the roadway that we're not going to be standing right um, next to the traveling public, not only for our safety, but to minimize uh, distraction of drivers uh, as well. And so, um, again, within our SOPs, we have some guidelines for how to deploy to minimize the uh, uh, potential impact of driver distraction. Um, and we look to the industry to, as, as that evolves, uh, FHWA uh, and FAA may uh, come out with rulings on that. Right now we have some rules of thumb that we try to adhere to and, and it hasn't presented any, any sort of difficulties for us uh, so far. I can just add to what, our, what we typically do for our operations at the Department of Transportation. We do erect signs on both sides of the roadway to notify the traveling public that there are unmanned aircraft operations. 
our thought process is that for that is to, is because I'd rather have my drivers informed that there's operations of them than them being startled because there's an aircraft that's uh, you know in the air. Uh, so th it, that's been our standpoint. So we do erect uh, signs to inform them when we perform operations. We try to perform them where it's not in direct line of sight of traffic. So if we're launching. Uh, near uh, moving vehicles, we try to launch from areas that, or or launch from an area that's a little further away from the roadway, and then maneuver the aircraft closer if we need it closer, uh, and to try to avoid that distracted driving piece. Great. Thank you for attending. Video of this webinar will be available on the research website next week. So you can go back and watch it. And Should I repeat that from here? Yes. So, thank you all for attending uh, this webinar. I've been told that the video uh, will be available. The video of this webinar will be available online uh, through a link on the ODOT website within a week. And uh, anyone who wants can uh, come back and view it again uh, or for the first time uh, there uh, a week out from now. Thank you.